And now, a presentation on the Mental Health News Radio Network. The Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. Ryan, that is a freaking awesome question. You are the power, and you do not need anybody's permission. He's the only guy that ever crawled out of a grave where people didn't go, oh, ah! Don't worry, don't be afraid, ever, because this is just a rock. You're, you're a great interviewer. You're one of the best. If this is the best God can do, I am not impressed. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Outer Limits of Inner Truth Radio Show. OuterLimitsRadio.com. I'm your host, Ryan. Tonight, we have one of the world's top minds when it comes to economic forecasting, and that's just encompassing the U.S. and global economy. Now you're probably thinking, oh no, you're going to do another show about the big crash you've been talking about forever. And we're going to touch upon it a little bit. We're definitely going to take a much more positive tone and look at it. Because even though we're probably going to see some chaos in the future, because it, it's, it happens. I mean, you have these cycles. You go through boom and bust. But this is going to be unique. It looks like this is going to change the whole system as we know it. There's probably going to be a lot of great opportunities for people to become wealthy. And to thrive after this and to thrive in a world that may not be so restrictive and to thrive in a world that it may actually have a lot more freedom. And if there's one thing we've been talking about on the show since the very beginning, it's about freedom. And that's why I focus shows to do with the economy because I want you to be as wealthy as possible. This stupid, stupid quote, money is the root of all evil. What a bunch of crap. No, no, it's not. If you're wealthy, you can change the world for the good. You can do a lot of wonderful and amazing things. And our featured guest is going to give a lot of great insights, tips, and advice on what to look out for. One of the greatest things I could do for you, I think, is provide people like this to help you further unlock the true potential within and to live the life that you know you deserve to have. My God, am I Tony Robbins right now? Am I Tony Robbins in training with that last line? We should put some theme music in the background. Yes, you can do it. You deserve that life. You deserve it. Let's begin tonight's show. Welcoming to the program is Harry S. Dent, founder of Dent Research. He's also a best-selling author. His latest book, one of his greatest books, is called Zero Hour. How to Turn the Greatest Political and Financial Upheaval in History to Your Advantage. You can learn more about Harry by going to his website at harrydent.com. You can also sign up for his free newsletter and get weekly updates. Mr. Dent, welcome to the program. Thank you for being with us today. Yeah, nice to be here, Ryan. I want to say that I think that you've got some tremendous insight. What do you foresee to be the biggest financial event happening in the next six to eight months? You've talked a lot about a coming crash, but what do you foresee as something specifically as a big event? Well, you know, the the biggest thing, and this is a a once-in-a-lifetime event. The last time what I'm talking about happened was 1929 to 32. I call it a great reset. It follows a debt bubble that creates a huge financial asset bubble in stocks and, you know, um, real estate and all types of stuff. People get rich and they feel all giddy, and then you have to come back down to reality and the bubble bursts. And of course, the um, central banks around the world have been keeping this bubble going um, since it first crashed in 2008, which I predicted 20 years before it happened, just on demographics slowing from baby boom spending. And now here we are, bubbled up again, way higher in stocks, real estate higher than than before in most places, and then double in Miami, where I used to live, uh, double the prices and stuff. So we're going to have to do what we didn't do in 2008 and 9 when they just printed trillions and trillions of dollars to cover it over and bail out everything. We're going to have to deleverage debt, and this financial bubble is going to have to come down to valuations where young people can invest in the stock market again and hope to retire on it or can buy a house again and afford it without stretching yourself to the hilt. So this is a good thing, but it is painful because a lot of wealth will disappear. People uh, are going to be shocked. You know, they think, oh, gosh, we'll never see anything as bad as 2008 and 9 again. I'm saying this is once in a lifetime. The beginning was 2008 and 9. We're going to get the bigger kick 
now that we've kicked the can down the road, starting probably in the next six to eight months, and it's going to take two to three years to work this out, and it's going to be painful. But if you see the reason it's so big, if you see the, this coming, and like Joseph Kennedy in 1929, pull your money out of risky assets like stock and real estate that's not strategic to your life, and preserve that at the top of the bubble, and then reinvest when things shake out two, three, four years from now, oh my God, you'll, you'll never increase your wealth or make more money and future opportunity than any time in your life in the next two to three years. The trick is you got to not listen to the experts here because they all want to keep the bubble going. They all want you to know nobody to panic. <laughs> You've got to see it coming. If you do for business or for investment, it, it will be the opportunity. It'll be the sale of a lifetime. I call it financial assets will be on sale. You could have bought anything in 1932, 33 and made money for decades. Same thing in, and you know, after the you know the last downturn at bottom in eighty two, you could have bought anything and just made money. Well, this is going to be the opportunity of a lifetime. But you, the trick is don't lose all you've gained when this reset happens because it is it's nasty. Stocks could go down eighty percent or more. Real estate went down thirty four percent on average last time. This time I'm predicting forty five to fifty percent. You know how much havoc that caused last time. So this is nothing to this is. You know, if I'm wrong, how much more gain can you get with everything so overvalued, the most overvalued in history? But if I'm right, boy, you're going to save a big hurt and create a huge opportunity. If I'm even half right. Well, thank you. And I'd love to go into more about these opportunities because we have covered the coming crash a lot in our program. We did a four-part 16 expert show on this. And I don't know, do you foresee this crash directly having an impact on the currency where – We'll have global hyperinflation where everyone's currency becomes completely worthless because then I, I've also listened to interviews with Jim's Rickard, Jim Rickard saying that, well, the dollar won't be completely worthless because it's so it's utilizing so many transactions. What do you foresee? Do you see it as a total decimation, a hyperinflation of the currency or a massive devaluation of the currency where they're going to have to go to something new that you'll still get really something out of it? We are going to have to go to something new for no other reason than Asia is going to be dominating the world from here on out, as it started with China in the early 80s. It's, I mean, India is going to make China look like nothing, you know, in the next boom and for many decades to come. And, yes, I mean, uh, the currencies and money has been artificially manipulated beyond any time in history, and we're going to have to have standards that don't let that happen again. But I'm telling you, I'd say this to Jim Rickards, and I've debated him before, and I like him. He's a smart guy. Jim, what happened in 2008? Gold went running to mommy down 33% in the crash, silver 50%, and the U.S. dollar, which is supposed to be worthless, went up 27%. The dollar is the best house in a bad neighborhood. We haven't printed anywhere near as much money as Europe has compared to our GDP, and not even a fraction of what Japan has. In China, they don't print money. They print condos. That's even worse. They got empty stuff everywhere. The lowest money velocity, the most unproductive investment of any country in history, rivaling Japan. And where has Japan been for the last 30 years? Dead. DOA. We, I was the only one in the world that predicted we'd have the greatest boom in history in the 90s because of baby boom spending around the world. But Japan would have a major crash. And, and that's all demographics. And it's also Japan did the same thing. China expanded very rapidly, urbanized very rapidly, overbuilt everything, created a huge bubble, too much debt, and then the whole bubble burst. And they've never come back from it. So China is going to get hit the hardest here. They're going to take the longest to come back. And I'm saying India is the next China. Well, maybe worse than the U.S. as far as coming back? Because oh, when, see, when oh, I see China... Oh, no, no, no we're, we're going to lead. I mean, we have better demographics than most other developed countries. China is the only emerging country who's already seen their workforce peak. Their population is going to peak soon. They have declining demographics as far as the eye can see, just like Japan has had. Uh, that's what I saw in Japan. Japan was at the top of their baby boom spending cycle and their demographic cycle and went down before the rest of the world right at the top of a bubble. So I saw their bubble bursting and I saw their demographics going down when the U.S. and Europe and the rest of the world was just seeing their baby boom come into their prime in the 90s. So this is, this is simple stuff. We can predict when people spend money. 
I can predict any country in the world how fast they're urbanizing, how much their GDP per capita and income's going up for every percent urbanization, who's going to be richer in any point in history. And I'm telling you, India is going to be a bigger economy than China in the end and a that. bit richer and a bit richer per capita. Nobody sees that coming. So imagine if you'd have caught in the last big downturn that bottomed in 82, if you'd have caught got ahead of the China boom. That's the biggest expansion in modern history. Well, India is going to do something similar starting uh, three, four, five years from now in the next global boom, and nobody's going to see that coming. Okay. Because China has printed out more of the money, you said, in bo- bo- boatloads, maybe, maybe my understanding is that maybe sometimes three times as fast as some other nations, and because of the fact that they're also, at the same time, they're also acquiring a lot of gold, and they're also seem like they have more industry within their country than other other nations. All those factors coming in mind, do they stand the best chance at having the hardest crash as well as becoming one of the largest economies because of those two factors? Because I, when I see the U.S., I don't see a lot of industry. My understanding is that we have a lot of these you know, manufacturing jobs that are being constantly shipped overseas. We don't. Uh, we, yeah. we supposedly have a lot of gold, but I think that's a lot of people question that. So I'm wondering if China has these things going for it, how does that make us compare to them? Uh, China had everything going for it. It's urbanized. What it did was it overdid it, Ryan. It's just that simple. It, it's got 27% in the biggest cities, empty condos, 22% on average, empty houses everywhere. The biggest mall in the world is empty and had to be converted into a tourist attraction. They built, they're <laughs> building stuff for nobody. They're, they're accelerating and they're over-accelerating. China would not need to build another thing for 10 years to keep up with their past urbanization moving forward into maturity. So they've overbuilt. Their their debt has gone up 20 times in the last 20 years instead of, you know, for us, you know, doubling or something like that. I mean, they China doesn't do what we do. They don't print money like we do. The government guarantees all the loans for all these developers and crony communist regional party leaders. They 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 basically guarantee those loans and the loans are created down at that level so it doesn't show up in the Chinese national public debt like it does in ours and stuff, the private debt. And, and again, it, it, it's good to urbanize. Yes, they've just done it too much. And, and when you build more stuff, they have like 30 to 50 percent excess capacity in industry. So it's great to have all this industry and growth. But when you have excess capacity, you're unprofitable. I have a secret indicator, Ryan. It's called money velocity. Money velocity tells whether a country is productively investing or not. And I'm not going to get into that, but I could take 10 minutes to explain it. But China, coming into the last boom in the developed world, Japan had the lowest money velocity, building stuff for nobody, overexpand. If you overexpand, you have to discount to clear that capacity, and it's unprofitable. China has the lowest money velocity in the emerging world, and second only to Japan. It's, it's, <laughs> that alone would say China is not doing the right things. I'll tell you another thing China's not doing right. We're in a bottoms-up world ever since, first of all, electricity and cars and phones, but, but especially the Internet and computing and all this stuff. It's a bottoms-up world. And they're trying to run a country top down, Russia style, with state driven capitalism. Now, economists, because they're clueless and never had sex and run a business, think that's marvelous. I say state driven and capitalism, that's the worst combination. It's government who wants to please people in the short term and make people happy, and doesn't matter borrowing and doing anything to do it, then leveraging capitalism, which, you know, uh, has its own. Um, problems. That's why capitalism and democracy work well together. They, they're opposites. They balance each other. So China's got an outdated model, just like Japan had, and Japan went down. Again, I was the only guy I know in the world that predicted Japan would go down in one of the best decades in world history. And they went down because they had the wrong model. They overdid it. They created the massive bubble, bigger than our bubble. Uh, China's bubble makes our bubble look like nothing, and Japan's bubble made our bubble will look like nothing. So that's why Japan went down so hard, and that's why China. China is the epicenter of this great bubble. The U.S. actually was the epicenter of the Roaring Twenties bubble. We were the up-and-coming country. We were the China of the world. You know, and New York was the Shanghai, and we overdid it, and 
we had the biggest crash, although the world had a depression. China is the epicenter of this. So, so we, there's no way the, the yuan's going to take over. The Japan's already dead. Europe's got way worse monetary and demographics than we do. We're the best house in a bad neighborhood. I'm telling you, the U.S. dollar is going to go up if we have this crisis, and this is where the gold bugs are going to be wrong. They are right that you can't live on debt. You don't get something for nothing. I love when I give a presentation with Jim Rickards or Peter Schiff or somebody in our debate, our, our half of our slides are the same. Debt bubble. Debt, this is, you can't get something for nothing. Boo, 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 look at this. Look at this. It's the difference in I see it deflationary work out. Loans get written down. That means money disappears. Financial bubbles burst. Stock market loses 80, 90 percent of its value. Money disappears. And stock market is money. It's not just M2 they measure. And so you have a deflation of money, not hyperinflation. Why do you think we printed now $16 trillion since 2009, all central banks together, you know, four, four of it was the U.S. alone, but $16 trillion printed, and we still have zero, 1% inflation, 2% at most. It's because all this money is fighting deflation. That's the real trend, not inflation. The gold bugs expected inflation, and if we had gotten runaway inflation, gold would be at $5,000. Do you think that there's is, not this inflationary factor that the government says is such a short inflation? Do you think it could be a lot higher? No, no. What we got, Ryan, is we got financial asset inflation instead of consumer price inflation because all the increase in money that the government created bought bonds and was injected into the banking and financial system and caused stock markets and bonds to go up in value, not money supply and inflation. It didn't go to create inflation and growth in the economy from increasing money by the Fed. Banks have to lend it and multiply it. Banks aren't lending. Everybody overborrowed in the great boom. Businesses overborrowed. Consumers overborrowed. Housing bubble, all this stuff. So it didn't have, when they, when they came in to save the economy in early 2009, they created a lot of money and they thought, oh, well, this get the economy going. No, the economy's growing as slow as it did in the 1930s, 2% real GDP on average from top to, to bottom. What's happened is we've created the greatest financial bubbles in history, and that's what has to reset, Ryan, and that's what's going to kill people. Their stocks are going to disappear. Their real estate's going to go down 50%, and a lot of people got 70, 80, 90% loans against it. They're going to be underwater worse than 2008 and 9, and that's where people are going to get hit. All, I give you, if you just see this coming and get out of that stuff and don't have the exposure to these risky assets, every time they fall, your money's going to buy more couple of years ahead at the bottom. You're going to be able to buy a much better house at a fraction of the price, and you're going to be able to buy the same great long-term companies like Apple or Google or Netflix or whoever at 80% off. What could what better way to create wealth? I think that's, that's exactly terrific. What did. But Harry, what should, what should people do? What should, should they take their money out of dollars? Should they purchase gold and silver, hang on to that as a means of hedging their bets against inflation and then utilizing precious metals when it happens? Like, What should people be no, 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 the, the opposite. You take your money out of risky, the riskiest assets, which is now not gold, but it is, it is stocks, and especially real estate, and especially high-end, bubbly real estate, and you convert it into high-quality bonds and cash. You don't buy the gold yet. I'll tell you where you buy the gold. You buy the gold at the bottom, too, because gold peaked with the 30-year commodity cycle. That's another clock-like cycle we cover in zero hour. And it is um, holding up better than other commodities because gold does have those special qualities. And gold will probably go down to a new low, maybe 1,000, maybe as low as 700 in this crash. It will then have the, the next commodity boom will be the probably the greatest in history because it could be driven by Asia and particularly the two biggest gold-buying countries in, in the world. And not for investment as much as for jewelry, China and India and Asia. So gold could be $5,000 an ounce, but only in the next commodity boom, and that will go from about 2023 to 2038 to 40, roughly. So I'm, I'm not gold will deflate like it did last time. Gold correlates with inflation, Ryan, perfectly. Gold was the best investment in the 70s crisis where we had a deep recession combined with rising inflation. I call that the summer season of the economy. This is the fall bubble boom season going into winter. That's when you get bubbles, and that's when bubbles crash, and commodities crash with it. 
So so gold is, is one of the best investments at the bottom. So will be Asian stocks, particularly India and Southeast Asia. Uh, bonds will be terrible because we'll go back to a, at least a mild inflationary economy. Gold likes inflation. Bonds don't. So, so gold and, and, and stocks, but particularly in, in, in Asia, Southeast Asia and India particularly, that's where, where the best return is going to be. U.S. is going to be a slower growth country. Japan's dead. Europe's never going to grow again. Their demographics are way worse than ours. We're the best house long-term and short-term in the developed world, but we don't even compare to what's going to happen in Asia. So you're going to have to, people here are going to have to start investing more in Asia, but you don't buy Asia yet either because China's going to get hit the hardest here, and India is the one emerging country stock market that is, is still at, at new highs, and they're going to have to take a big crash. But then I would buy India hand and fist. I'd buy gold and silver hand and fist and other commodities. That's, that's the big – there's a bunch of things we say in the book you can do, but that's the two big things. Next commodity boom and, the, and Asia, particularly Southeast Asia and India, are going to drive the next boom, and that's where the great profit's going to be. The developed world is going to be moving sideways at best, and many countries are going to be declining. I mean, it's, we're aging. You know, that is that simple. And we measure and project that aging. That's how I saw the Japan crash when they looked at their best in 1989. I said they're aging and their baby boom and their big bubble is already over. They had the same bubble we're having before us and the same baby boom, strong economy, all the things we're experiencing. And yet, how many economists look at Japan and learned any damn lesson from Japan? None of them. Clueless people who never ran a business, never had sex. So I don't listen to economists except for Dr. Lacey Hunt. I don't even listen to the gold bugs now because they're right about the crisis. They're wrong. When they say hyperinflation, I'm like, okay, if $16 trillion didn't create even modest inflation, what, what are they got to print? $100 trillion? You're not going to get hyperinflation here. I'm worried about I just see Venezuela, and I, so, and I say, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to experience that. And yeah, yeah, but, but look at history. Only banana republics have that. Germany was the only developed country, and that's because they lost World War II hugely in debt, and then they got giant reparations on top of it. They had to print money just to pay their bills. That was an exception. But, We've never seen global hyperinflation. But doesn't the U.S. have $120 trillion worth of unfunded liabilities on top of the $20 yes, trillion in yeah. debt? Yeah, and you know what happens? You get people to retire at 75 instead of 65, and a lot of that will go away. Just really? one simple change. And you know what? We're living longer than that compared to Wendy's program. I mean, it's stupid. You know, Social Security, Medicare, conceived in the late 30s, grown. We're still retiring at 65 when we're living like 12, 15 years uh, longer on average. This is crazy. Well, before we answer the next, go to the next question, I just want to remind everyone, you can learn more about Harry by going to his website, harrydent.com, and sign up for a newsletter. And I've, gone, I've watched a lot of your speaking agents before. I find you really interesting. And... When we have a massive liquidation of debt, and say, for example, debt gets wiped, up, wiped off, I'm wondering if there's a correlation between that and a crash and a shift in consciousness. Because for some reason in the world, at least in the U.S., you see a lot of people that are very pro-socialism. And you see a lot of people that are having a different perspective where they want to be taken care of. There's a lot less self-reliance. And I'm wondering if when this next crisis happens, it's going to force people to think differently. It's going to force a massive shift in thinking, hopefully for the better. Maybe yeah, yeah. I, I think it is going to – I think you're right, right. All of this putting this off and governments printing money to cover it over, what you do in the winter season, which officially started in 2008, and our GDP from the top in 2007 has grown no faster than it did from 29 to 40 through, through the entire Great Depression cycle, which is cumulatively 19 percent versus 20 percent back then. This is – we're in the winter season. It's just they've blown up the stock market to create a lot of artificial wealth, and who does that? impact the top 20 percent that owns 88 percent of financial assets like stocks and particularly the top one percent to point one percent the top one percent already control 50 percent of the wealth and the point one percent half of that so it's only making inequality longer when this crash happens people are going to realize okay Government's printing money. You don't solve problems by covering them over and kicking the can down the road. Everybody knows that already, but it seemed to be working, and Warren Buffett said it was all right, so people kind of going along with it. People are going to realize, oh, my God, we can't afford – nobody can afford – the Social Security, Medicare – 
is way underfunded, and the peak of demands on that system are going to be way out in 2029 and be high for a long time because baby boomers are going to be retiring for a long time. We're not going to be able to retire at 65 when, when people who live to be 65 live to be 85 on average. The longer you live, the longer you live by the life expectancy statistics, which are another factual thing. So we're going to have to retire later. We're going to have to have more reasonable entitlement programs. That means people are going to come down to earth. The same thing happens, Ryan, when labor unions, the, the industries get destroyed by the strongest labor unions. When the industries finally collapse, <laughs> then the labor unions agree <laughs> to cut their benefits by 50%. This, we're all going to have to wake up and get real. We're going to have to realize that stocks aren't going to go up 20 to 30% a year for the rest of our lives. Housing's not going to go up at 10% when the inflation rate averages three. It's going to go up 3%, a zero real return. That's reality for long-term real estate. We're going to have to get in a real investment world. Oh, real estate, what a monopoly. What do we get paid for? Or oh, the rents or the savings and rents. We don't sit in our house watching our TVs and, and get rich sitting on our ass doing nothing, which people have in, the, in, in recent decades. So we're all going to get more real estate, and that means people are going to be more productive again. They're going to work longer, harder. They're going to save in real terms and not just get rich off their house going up doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Australia, I, I go to twice a year to lecture. I'm really popular over there because they don't have as many experts and stuff. Well, you're talking about the real estate market, how they're going to they're deal with some kind of crash there. But... They Oh, they are the second most overvalued Jeez. in the world only second to China, and, and they don't see it coming because the real estate's done so well there because it's so limited in supply. They live in a desert with oceans surrounding it, so it's like California. So so Australia's in, in for a real shot. But guess what? When I look at that money velocity indicator, Australia with an incredible demographics from Asian immigration, you know, all, you know, all these natural resources they have for free, their money velocity is also, it's even lower than Europe because people in Australia, their biggest focus is speculating in housing and fixing up their houses, not producing real goods and services, you know? So, so we're all going to get a wake-up call, and, and it's going to be for the better. you got to realize, after the great crash, the worst in history, 29 to 32, the U.S. soared. The whole world came screaming out of that. Well, the demographics aren't as strong this time for the developed countries. But still, this reset is going to be a good thing, and particularly changing people's psychology. People now just expect things that are totally unreal, and people are – living more off of speculation than good old-fashioned hard work and productivity. Oh, oh, and by the way, our productivity's dropped from 3 to 4% down to half percent to 1%, going to zero as we age. So we, we need a reset. I hope so. I really do hope so. I really love freedom. I'm very passionate about freedom and the, the fact that so many people want something for nothing. I know it's an infringement upon the, the productive members of society. Harry, I've had the pleasure of speaking with Jim Rogers, and I've also spoken spoken with Gerald Salenti a number of times and when I've spoken to Jim Rogers he said that some of the things he does to, to gain an insight into the world is I guess he he motorcycles he takes a motorcycle yeah. goes all over the world and then Gerald not only does he read every day but he also meditates so what do you do to give you the competitive edge in your insight are you, are you a reader do you listen to speakers is, do you trust your intuition how do you come what is your methodology of, of ultimately gaining a, a greater edge into the market and predictions that other people have well, well, two things. I, I got my MBA at Harvard Business School. I never regret that. I learned I, what I really learned there was what I was good at and really got a big picture life. But I got my PhD on my own study. I would never go back to an academic school now. I can learn so much on the internet with Googling and stuff. And I got I used to have three full time research assistants feeding me. Now I have I split one with my partner because it's so much more efficient. So I I research everything. I, and I look outside of the box. Most economists, oh, and they wouldn't look at sunspot cycles. Sunspot cycles is my best shorter-term indicator. The best thing I've found since the spending wave that can predict when countries are going to grow you know, decades in advance. So I, I think out of the box, and I push anywhere that I can find a correlation, but I won't get behind a cycle or an indicator unless it makes sense, number one, and it correlates. And the other thing I do is travel. I, I learn 
so much by traveling. You see different cultures. You actually see history, because I, I study history to get these cycles. But when I go to the backwoods of India, I'm seeing life like it was as much as 5,000 years ago. You know, I go to Europe, you know, I see life, you know, like it was maybe, you know, hundreds of years ago. I grew up in the South. That was like growing up in the 1800s instead of the 1900s. I'm <laughs> serious. You know, it was whole different cultures, different ways of life. I see people in different stages. Of, of technology and culture and stuff. And, and boy, I mean, that's, uh, you know, my, I, I don't, I didn't have, have kids. I have three step kids. The thing I do, I send them around the world too. If you travel like Jim Rogers, Oh, there's no better way to learn than that. And I study history of everything. And I've studied back to the big bang. I study everything. I, awesome. I got the same four season and, 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 and cycles I have for a billion year climate thing is 100,000 as a 10-year you know, sunspot wow. cycle. Same cycle on bigger and smaller scales. So I'm really a cycle nut. And people, I'm more known for my demographics because that was the unique thing I came up with in the 80s. But no, I study all cycles. And demographics is my number two cycle now, the technology cycle and this in a 90-year bubble big bubble cycle, which, again, the last one was 1929, and before that, 1837 to 42 crash. Those are the two biggest resets in U.S. history, 1837 to 42, 1929 to 32, the bottoms of those two, exactly 90 years, and now we're talking late 2019, maybe early to mid-2020 into late 2022 or so. Another great reset on a 90-year cycle. If you look at history, this would look like, oh, this has got to happen. This wouldn't be, oh, it might kind of maybe somewhat happen. This is like destiny. I mean, we, all you got to do is look that far. It's just like walking down the street and saying, oh, the world's flat. Well, how far do you have to go up in a satellite before you realize, no, it's round. So it's that type of insights I get from studying history and traveling. That's my two real kind of magic ways that I learned. And, and I tell you, I just... I, and particularly, I like to go to emerging countries because I'm seeing farther back into civilization and history. I mean, literally, people in the backwoods of India living with no electricity. None. Imagine that. When it comes to history, I love uh, American history. And I, I have so much admiration and respect for our founding fathers. I wish they were... Uh, Oh. They, they wish, I mean, the fact yeah, that, that was the greatest. That, that's the biggest thing. That was bigger than the agricultural revolution ten thousand years. The the democracy, which was invented here, and the steam engine, and free market capitalism, which came from Adam Smith. All three of those had a big breakthrough in seventeen seventy six. So I got big cycles around that. But America, the biggest thing in history, happened right here. And our founding fathers. That that was unbelievable genius at the right time. Do you see that happening again in the U.S.? Do you see that happening again in the world? Because again, but it comes to freedom. Yes. I am. Yes. we are on passionate. that. That's a 250 year cycle. We are right on that. It's also an 84 year populist cycle um, with Trump and Brexit. All of this stuff. We're going to see huge changes in how we organize. You know, the biggest thing, technologies do all types of stuff. You know, produce new products and make workers more productive, all this stuff. It's the organizational changes, like the moving assembly line. That was a huge thing from Henry Ford. Huge, huge, huge. Again, where did that happen? Not in Europe, in the United States. Huge thing that came out and made the average worker 10 times more productive. I've got a whole thing in all my books back to the roaring um, 2000s back in 1998 says, look, companies can run from the bottoms up, put the information on the front lines, let the front line workers make decisions for consumers, have them accountable down to the profit and everything and give them all the information and quit having them have to answer to supervisors and managers that don't know crap about anything and never seen a customer. Companies can work in a whole different way. And this, this crisis is going to basically reward the companies that do that and disreward the top-down run companies and guess who's the most top-down run country in the world china they're wow. going to get their ass kicked because they're doing they got the wrong strategy for this era we are going to have they, we're going to look back in history and this is going to be a critical time kind of like the late 1700s when we look back 100 years from now I, I agree with you i just i don't know i, I just can sense something definitely is big changing when you look at various companies throughout the world, I'm sure you probably see ones that are thriving, ones that aren't doing so good. 
if you look at some of these CEOs, how do you identify right away whether a company is going to be successful based on the attitudes and the mentality of a CEO? If you meet an individual, how is there any way you can tell right away if that person is going to have a long-term impact on the world based on the mentality, based on the vision, based on the, the mannerisms? Well, you know, I mean, uh, the, the people I see, you know, Jack Stack is my favorite one. He took a manufacturing company in Ohio back in the 80s. He wrote a book the same time my first book came out in 1989 called The Great Game of Business. He taught his front, he taught his people in his factory and his frontline people how to make money, how business works, and made and, and, and got them making decisions. And when they made decisions, he could pay them more because they're adding value instead of being rote, rote, nutless monkeys doing, you know, work that anybody could do. We're losing all these factory jobs because they were designed by Henry Ford to have very low skill. It was the system that made them productive. So you can do that in Vietnam. You can do that in China. You can do it in Mexico. And people can immigrate in here and do it here. So that's why we're losing those jobs. If Artificial intelligence, if we make the everyday person feed them with real-time information, who their customers are, exactly what they want, exactly what they buy, exactly how to customize products and services they need right on the spot and how profitable that is, a person with just good common sense and human qualities and some creativity can become a kick-ass machine. And that's basically Jack Stack's company in Ohio. Most of his employees are now not middle class. They're millionaires. That's the future. It's not bringing the factory jobs back because by the time we bring them back from China, if we do, robots are going to take them over. They are repetitive skills. Same with bureaucratic work in corporations, office work, bureaucratic work, accounting, you know, all this sort of stuff, paperwork. That stuff all going to be taken over by the computers at light speed. What it does, it frees up people to serve other people. What I don't get from companies is personalized service. I don't get what I want. I get what the companies decide they can afford to give me when and how they do it. And you know what? I don't like that. I'm, I can't wait for these companies to get damn near destroyed so they learn how to organize around me. So I look for the CEOs. All they care about, their end customers and their frontline workers. That's where their focus is. Not the back lines, not the experts, not their management team and all that crap. They care. They focus on the customer and what does it take to serve them on the front lines. How do we make our frontline people the best people in the world? That's the, that's the people who have the vision of the future from my point of view. That's, that's how a company runs from the bottoms up instead of the top down. Management is the problem. Our stock exchanges that are totally digital now and paperless, there's no management. You don't see the management. It's all in the software that runs at light speeds. Who drives the stock exchanges every day? The users buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. And they know, right, real-time feedback. How much money did I make? How much did I lose? Boom, 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 boom. That's a network company, real-time, personalized service. That's the future. Managers that think, well, we've got to do this and that. We've got to streamline our bureaucracy. No, you already got it wrong. You're going to streamline yourself into the deathbed. You're going to die if you're top-down. In China, the best thing happening in China right now is these riots in Hong Kong. China's problem, super top-down. Bigger than that, their one-child policy, which came from their same top-down ignorant policies, um, creates fewer young people, so they, it's hard to have a revolution. Well, in Hong Kong, they're having a revolution, and they're not going to give up, and that's, that's what China needs to do. They need to topple that damn government. The yeah, government is the problem. And, and the credit system, which I hope never comes here. And oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's awful. It's, it's, it's the worst, it's the greatest bubble in the world. Nobody's created more debt as fast as China, and therefore they're going to have the biggest bubble burst and debt burst. That you, simple. Just a one more question, final question for you is, what two historical figures have you respected the most in terms of their thinking abilities, their ability to have a vision of the future, and also what would be one or two things that you hope all people learn about your thinking style and your visionary predictions? Okay. I'd say two people I'd have to pick out way back. At, since I'm in economics, Adam Smith was the first real economist and had more vision. He basically created the basis and the way of thinking for free market capitalism. Free market capitalism wasn't even a term before he published his book, The Wealth of Nations, in 1776. So I aspire to be the next Adam Smith. In, in going back just to the last cycle, 
If I had to pick one person, Henry Ford and that moving assembly, Henry Ford was a son of a bitch. People didn't like him. You know, but he was an innovator. He saw that everyday workers could be ten times more productive. He saw that everyday workers, that his everyday frontline workers were going to be able to buy his expensive luxury cars in a short period of time. That guy had vision. Steve Jobs today is similar, not Bill Gates. Bill Gates, a really shrewd businessman, right place, right time, ran with the football. Steve Ballmer helped him. Steve Jobs saw way back in the late 70s that people would have supercomputers in their hands hooked up to something like the Internet. He saw that from the beginning. That's a visionary. Um, and what do I want from people? I don't want people to just listen to my forecast. I want people to learn to think in cycles. People think in straight lines. There's not a straight line in the world. Nothing goes in straight lines. Everything goes up and down in cycles. It's the, it's the dynamics like free, like free market capitalism and democracy. These are opposites, male and female, boom and bust, inflation and deflation. These things are necessary dynamic to create energy and growth and progress. And yet everybody wants, oh, we want the boom and not the bust. Oh, we want the light, not the dark. No, sorry. You need to accept cycles because they're reality. If, if you know the sun's going to – if the sun's going to come up every morning, doesn't it help to know if, it's gonna, if you're going to get winter once a year? Doesn't it help to know it's going to happen? We didn't know this a long time ago. I want people to understand that cycles are your friend if you understand them. And just like I tried to say at the beginning of this interview, the most opportune time to make the most progress or money or whatever you're talking about is in the most difficult cycle, which is winter. So if you see, understand cycles, you know you have to have a different strategy for each season, just like you dress differently for each season of the weather. Uh, what, 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 if, you, if you had most, the way most people think, you'd buy a sweatshirt and jeans and go through the whole cycle in the same clothes. No, you dress different for every season. Different strategy for businesses, for investment, for governments in each season, and you, and you learn to turn cycles to your advantage. What most people do is get in denial. No, I just want to see the boom and not the bust. <laughs> and and econom- economists want to create an economy that grows at 3% plus a year with 1% to 2% inflation and never has a recession. You know what that economy is? Japan, a coma <laughs> economy, dead, no innovation, dying in the emergency room. So, so you have to have the dynamics. I want people to learn to think differently and to have a vision of this bottoms-up world, this network world. Don't think in hierarchies anymore. Value women. Women have skills that are much more valuable on, in the network world than they had in the old world, and they are rising. And understand, and I'm telling you, i got a cycle for this that's crystal clear. Asia is nice, not just China and their big overdue expanse, Asia is where all the action is going to be for, for my lifetime, my stepkids' lifetime, and their kids' lifetime. So, so there's things you can see coming and plan for them. I, my motto is you can see all the key cycles and trends that will impact your life, your business, your family over the rest of your lifetime and your investments. That's the way. I, I want people to think like that instead of just reacting. Oh, oh, now, now this happened. Oh, should we buy or sell? No, no, no. You know this in advance. We saw the crash of 2008 coming in 1988, 20 years before it happened. That's how predictable these cycles are. Harry S. Dent Jr., I want to thank you so much for being with us today. It was a great honor considering you know, reading your books and watching your videos for a number of years. Thank you so much. You can learn more about Harry by going to his website at harrydent.com. Also sign up for his newsletter, one of his most recent books. It's called Zero Hour, Turning the Greatest Political and Financial Upheaval in Modern History to Your Advantage. Mr. Dent, thank you so much, sir, for your time. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. All right, everyone. That concludes today's edition of the Out of Limits of the Truth. Special thanks to our exceptionally insightful guest, Mr. Harry Dent. And special thanks, as always, to our virtues, Miss Carrie O'Connor, Miss Lisa Kaza, and Miss Constance Dallas. To learn more about the Outer Limits of Inner Truth, please go to our website at outerlimitsradio.com. And till the next time we meet, my friends, I wish upon you an abundance of peace, love, and beers. Take good care, and thank you so much for listening.